Hola, comadres. Welcome to another episode of Comadreando. I'm your host, Marcy. And today we have an amazing guest. Her name's Melanie, and I will let her introduce herself. Who are you? Hello, everyone. My name is Melanie. I am a mom of a brachial plexus, uh, now adult son. Uh, he has brachial plexus. It was a birth injury that he obtained during birth. And he's only able to use one hand um, and his, his, his affected hand and arm is his left. And so I'm, I'm a proud mom of a brachial plexus son who has skyrocketed and soared and everything he's put, you know, he's attempted and he's put his mind to do. So I'm a proud mom of him. Awesome. So um, Melly and I could connected via social media um, through the podcast. We started following each other. Um, I noticed that she was like an advocate for special education and um, for people with special needs. So I decided to bring her on the show um, to discuss today's topic. And today's topic is supporting special needs parents' mental health needs. And the reason why the topic came up is because we often forget um you know, yes, we're supporting the kids, but the parents' mental health is like one of the most important things because, um, as I've said time and time again on the show, um, you know, we can't pour from an empty cup. So it's of the utmost importance to actually, you know, take care of your own mental health mm -hmm. as well. So, um, and what better other person to help us with that than Melanie? Um, so before we get started, I wanted to um, get like some minute details out of the way. So what's your career? Uh, I am a legal administrator. Uh, I work in a large law firm and that's a very busy position. Okay. Um, and what made you choose that career? I've been in the legal industry for a number of years um, and it was just kind of one of those kind of try it before you buy it situation. So I actually uh, worked in a small firm. And then once I got into working at the small firm, you know, sky was the limit. I moved around. I learned a lot of different things. And it was very, it was very enlightening on, you know, the law and different areas that it covers. And so fast forward to, you know, me needing some legal advice and in an area that, um, skyrocketed my career because I was able to work in an area that I knew a lot about. So I chose it because it was just absolutely interesting and I decided to just keep going. That's awesome. So I want you to kind of dig a little bit deeper and can you share with the comadres what your experience has been like being a mom, um, especially after your son sustained that injury during birth? Um, I'm going to chime in when you're done because I actually met another parent who has the same, her, their child had the same injury mm -hmm. and is also on the spectrum. So we'll okay. talk about a little bit about that later. Okay. So, um, yeah, just share with us your experience about what it has been like being a mom and like your transition from the initial diagnosis to now that he's an adult. Okay. Thank you, Marcy. So it's the experience was, of course, it was it was devastating um, because you just think you're going to go into the hospital on your due date. You're going to have a child and you're going to come home and that's going to be that. That is far from what happened. And so the details of that are he was 11 pounds, as I think I said earlier. And instead of giving me a C-section, you know, I pushed and pushed and he would he did, he was just out from his neck up. His shoulders were very broad, so he wasn't able to be brought out and pushed out. So they reached in in the panic because of his vitals were, you know, all over the place and snatched him out by his left arm. And as, as it happened, that tore the T4 and T5 nerve from his spinal cord. Of course, those were irreparable for surgery or anything else. And so he's unable to use his left hand and arm. Um, and so that was a very devastating blow to our family because you know, that's not what we expected. Um, he was a very large child. And so there was some conversation around there being a possibility that I had gestational diabetes. And no one told me. And um, that would have been nice to know uh, because there would have been a different course of action uh, during delivery. And so fast forwarding to, you know, just the, the, the entire life 
of him and coming up, you know, being a young a baby, going through, you know, surgeries and physical and occupational therapy. He started occupational physical therapy at age seven days. He was seven days old, a whole week. And we started. And from then on, we went three times a week. We went to therapy. He's had several surgeries. It was very hard because I didn't have any connection to really anyone that had the same or similar issue that I had. So it was, I was kind of, you know, a fish out of water. What am I doing? How do I, you know, I didn't know how to navigate the waters. I didn't know what to do. Um, and at the time the hospital did have uh, a brachial plexus, brachial plexus, plexus, I can't say that support group. And it was, it was a, a small group and because of everyone's schedule, it kind of didn't really go. We didn't, we weren't able to meet a whole lot. Uh, and that was a good source just from what I could get. But, you know, the, the, the regular worries are when they go to school, what are they going to do when they turn five or go to preschool at four? You don't know what's going to happen. And so that's pretty much um, the big worry was him going to school with other kids and how would he be perceived and what would they think? You know, because he has an arm, he has two arms, but one doesn't work as well. So you always worry about, are kids going to make fun of him? Are people going to talk about him? You know, how limited is he going to be at school? You know, you just don't know those things. And so, of course, those questions were raised in our family. And it was like, you know, what do we do? We have to figure this out. And so it was more, it was just a, a you know, you figured out as you, we went ahead. And, and that was what we did until we got to a point where, okay, we got this now. We know what to do. He's had these surgeries. It's going to make things better, you know, and his arm is, he's never going to be able to use it fully. It just, you know, the surgery didn't make his arm better. It just kept it from getting worse. And so with that, uh, we just kind of, you know, we went full steam ahead. We worked it out. We, you know, he had an amazing group of physical and occupational therapists at his children's hospital here locally. And we moved forward and we worked through all of those issues and we worked through you know, getting some movement and getting some things done and him being able to use his 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 hand as much as he could for the limited ability that he had. How did that affect you as a mom, like mental health wise? Like what how did you feel at first? Like I know it must have been shocking and maybe um I don't know, maybe maybe you felt a little defeated because, you know, we have certain expectations mm -hmm. when our children are born and then kind of having get, having that snatched away in one fell swoop must have been very hard for you. It was, Marcy. It was, I felt like I was living in the twilight zone. I felt like I was watching myself in a movie. I was there, but I was watching myself as all these things were happening it's during his birth, of course. And then afterwards, it was like I, I was just stuck because it was like, what do you do? Um, honestly, I, I, I was angry um, because how dare you do this to my son? How dare how dare you? You know, and, and, and they kind of kind of brushed it off like, oh, it'll get better. You know, it'll it'll get better. He'll be able to move it in a few weeks. Well, he's 26 now. So when when is the movement going to start? You know what I mean? And it's amazing that you have to go through that because you have the mental part of it. And the mental was just, he's not like everybody else. And, you know, again, as I said, it's, you know, how's he going to move forward in life? You know, what are his limitations going to be? What's he going to be able to do? What he's not going to be able to do? How can I help him fully? It was, there was a lot of questions in my mind that I had to work out and figure out, you know, because there was just a lot of, it was just thrown at you, just thrown at you. And you had to just catch it and deal with it. That was hard. Um, again, I said I was angry about it because I didn't know what to do. Um, I was angry because it happened and it didn't have to. Uh, those years ago when he was born, I mean, of course, modern medicine is nothing like it is now. But at that point, this, of course, could have been prevented. Just have given me a C-section or A, told me that I had gestational diabetes or B, say, we're not sure how to proceed here, but here's a plan of action. Nothing like that happened. And so, you, you know, you go in the hospital and you trust the professionals to be professional and to tell you what's going on. And since that didn't happen, I was angry at that as well. So it plays a big part mentally on you because you don't know everything's a question mark and you don't know what to expect. 
Rightly so, though, because, like, your son is how old? 21, 22? 26 now. 26. Mm-hmm. And it's still happening. Still happening. The parent... The parent I met, um, she she's actually one of our listeners. I'm gonna, gonna give her a shout out. She's one of the comadres. Her daughter was born with a brachial ble- not born with it. They injured her when she was born, mm-hmm. and her son too. Like they both have ish- injuries, and they're four years, three and four years old. So you're so she it's has two still different freaking children. Happening. And it's still ha- that's. Two children, the same thing happened to the sa- in the same family, which is insane. Like I, I like no, no, wait. I'm sorry. She has uh, the little boy has the brachial plexus injury, right? Okay, okay. And then um, there's another little girl in swimming. Sorry, that is not not they're not related, but she oh, also okay. has the same injury. Mm-hmm. But it's still happening, and these kids. What is it? 2022. These kids were born what? 2019, and it's still happening. Still happening. Mm-hmm. This is why I advocate so much for like people educating themselves and advocating for themselves in the hospital. Like the doctors, they can tell you whatever, but at the end of the day, you are the one that is okaying or not okaying the course of action. Absolutely. Like you can always advocate for yourself. You don't have to take what they say or what they're trying to do. Like I wanna, I want us as 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 women right as birthing mm-hmm. people mm-hmm. to have if possible the most natural births right the right. least intervention you know to avoid these kind of f- catastrophes a lot of the time like there's things that the doctors do i follow this account there's things that doctors do they're not supposed to you know when they stick their fingers in there to like move your cervix like to to like efface your cervix they're not supposed to do that they do. The episiotomy, they're not supposed to. They're not even supposed to really induce you. The baby comes when it comes. The baby comes when it comes. Unless you're having, like, severe health issues, mm-hmm. you are supposed to just let it rock. Like, let the baby come when they come. It's, a, it's the, the medical field right now. It is a money... What is it, is it, is it, is it a business, right? It's a business. It's, they're in business it's, to make it's money. Not, exactly. It's not in their best interest for you to have a natural birth. No, it is not in their best interest for them not to intervene um surgically. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I was looking at the hospital bill. I don't I, I had told you this before. I was looking at the hospital bill after I gave birth to my son Aiden and only the OBGYN for the C section was eighty thousand dollars. Thank God I had insurance. Okay? That was just the OBGYN. The anesthesiologist was another forty thousand dollars. Okay? Over one hundred and twenty thousand to give birth yep. to a child in yep. a hospital, mm-hmm. and it could be more. Okay, what whoever else gets involved? I mean, and this have- was in two thousand eight, girl. This was in two thousand eight. I don't even want to know how much it costs now. It, it's it's ridiculous. The care. And then the thing we- is, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry, we don't. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, like, as people of color, especially women of color, first mm-hmm. of all, we're we're the ones that. I don't know if you've seen this um, documentary about, um, I have to look up the name, but it's about um, the birth rates and like the treatment in the hospitals of women of color. I've seen right? it. And, and mm-hmm. right. I think it's called, um, oh my God, I'll look it up while you're talking, but it, it, it's, it's like an epidemic in this country. And then the fact that it hasn't gotten better mm-hmm. 20 years later, we're still dealing with the same stuff and people are dying in hospitals, Absolutely. you know, when they shouldn't be, you know, the modern medicine, quote unquote, is so advanced. Yet we're still having black and brown people dying at a higher rate in hospitals Absolutely. during births than any other people. That's true. That That is 200 percent true. And I think the documentary, doctor, documentary you were speaking about, I saw some of it, but I didn't get to finish it. And they were taught there were several African American mothers that their husbands were telling the story mm-hmm. because she died on the table. She okay, died. It's during called childhood. aftershock. I just aftershock. remember it's called aftershock. 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 I haven't watched the entire part, but just to hear there are some things I know my limit and some things I just cannot watch. I I have to watch that because that that I understand that. And I've almost lived I've lived that to a point. Um but Things like that, that makes me so angry because 
even though there are modern advances in medicine, we don't get to benefit from it at all. As people of color, we do not get to benefit. It's a disadvantage that it's it's and it's a disparity among people of color. Um, you know, the birth rates and the injuries. I mean, you, you know, I'm looking back, I'm thinking, you know, maybe by, you know, some other children being born, this will this will be a thing of the past. Not a, not at all. And and it, it it's worse. It's worse. Um, I, I know people that are older than my son that have the injury. And I'm like, I had never heard of it. You, you know, it's not something you normally hear about. And I'm like, what? It, you know, I had to really do the research myself. And to find out that it's still happening in this modern medicine age, yeah, okay, yeah, it's modern. But it, who is it modern for? Who's getting the benefit from it? We're not. It it's really it's really wild and it's and it's disgusting. And um, so I follow this um like naturalistic birthing account, and um, she has this whole package of like taking charge of your birth. Um, she um, it, it's called like a lotus birth. So basically you have a like a like a legal package that you take with you to the hospital mm -hmm. to advocate for yourself mm -hmm. for no medical intervention like you're just going to the hospital to have the baby you're not letting them um cut the umbilical cord until it stops pulsing um they are not allowed to withdraw blood from your umbilical cord either because you know that stem cells that that can actually cure cancer yes so it, it the whole package like gives you a detailed um thing of like what you need to do mm -hmm. and um a lot of the time people don't know that you have these rights and then the thing is a lot of these doctors try to intimidate women mm -hmm. when they go into the to the thing but you have to know your rights you have to right know. you have to know your rights you have to know and but they don't tell you you know because you don't think about but now you have to you have to do your own advocating. You have to do your own doctoring. You have to do your own nurse. You have to do everything yourself because they don't tell you. You know, of course, the hospital has a leaflet or a booklet or a pamphlet that says, you know, patient's bill of rights. Yeah, but who reads that? Who who actually, because you're going in the hospital to deliver a child as I did and as we all have, and you come out, and for those of us that have, you know, children that have been injured at birth, you, you that's the furthest thing from your mind. That was the furthest thing from my mind that this was going to happen. I do know early on, he was born in June. And so in January, um, they, they actually done two or three ultrasounds, which, you know, back then that was unheard of because insurance didn't really want to pay for them. Um, okay. And so I had like three of them and I kind of, you know, cause I have a daughter that's older and I'm thinking I didn't have this many ultrasounds when she was, you know, when I was carrying her, what's the deal? thinking nothing of it, not knowing what to look for, they knew that, and it was determined, they knew in his medical record that he was, and they call it macrosomic, he was going to be a large child. So you couldn't plan a course of action to deliver him other than panicking at the last minute. Wait, hold up. So they knew he was going to be like over 10 pounds. They knew. How, how, wait, how, 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 how heavy was baby boy when he was born? 11. Girl. Yeah. Mm. Let me tell you, I know another mom, her child was 13 pounds. I was like, yeah. your baby, I was like, your baby nearly walked out talking from there because yeah. yo, yeah. that is a big yeah. baby. A and, big baby. And, and, and for the people that are not watching the YouTube video, Melanie's a petite woman. How tall are you, Melanie? I'm five, seven and a half. But that's still petite. But I'm you not. You have a small frame. What I'm saying is like, a... you have a small frame yeah. to have a 10, 11 pound baby. That's a lot. That that's that that was I, I thought his dad at the time went because he's a jokester and I was like he was in the hall I could hear him talking and when he was giving the weight I'm like you know I'm thinking to myself why is he playing with my fam why is he playing with everybody why is he telling people you know because I I didn't know because they delivered him and they got him out because they kept saying oxygen stat oxygen stat well I knew what that meant I just didn't know why and he came in and said how much he weighed I was like excuse me. Why would you make someone, it, yeah, so anyway, that they have, the advances are there. They just didn't pay attention. They just didn't want to do it. And then, you know, as you said, you got your bill and they had the nerve to send me a bill. Do you really think that, you know, and I had insurance as well, but it was like, do you really think 
you, you're going to charge. I mean, the, it was it was about as much as you said. It was in the in the hundred thousands or so. Do you really think after you've done all this and you know you didn't do you didn't do anything? I mean, they they induced me. No, they didn't induce me. They um, gave me a um, oh, what's it called? My mind's blank now. Uh, Pitocin. The Pitocin. They did that. Yeah, that's wow. a, that's induction. That's part of the that's induction. induction. Yeah, that's an informed induction. And and but they call it something else. But anyway, they did that, and that's all they did. I didn't get any special care. I didn't get anything else. Um, and and then this is the result. And so to hear and to you know in all my research to hear that other families are suffering like this from this particular injury, it's it's beyond. It it, be, it makes me beyond angry. I go beyond angry because it does not have to happen. Clearly, as I've learned, that when you carry a baby so big, there's a 99%. Now, this is what I've, my research is and what I've been told as well by medical and medical professionals is that if you're carrying a baby that big and it's just one, 99% of the time, there's some gestational diabetes involved. But no one told me that. I took the test. I did all of that. Call us back in such and such time and we'll give you your results. I call back. Oh, everything is fine. I remember it like it was yesterday. That's it. Didn't hear anything else. Oh, everything is fine. Well, clearly it wasn't because I was huge. I was almost 200. I was 260 pounds. That's huge. And, and I, you know, who am I? I'm, I'm, I'm a lay person. I'm not a medical professional. I don't know all that. And People would stop me and ask me if I were having twins. And that made me so mad because I'm like, am I really that big? Am I really that? Yeah. And it was one baby. It was not two or were not three. There was one. And that it's it's ridiculous that it's, that it's even still happening. And to be lied to and told, oh, it'll come back. It'll, it'll, it'll be OK. It'll, it'll wake up. It's just kind of, oh, I, I've heard all kind of stuff. You know, I remember it in that that day. Oh, it's gonna, you know, it's just a little lazy right now, and it's gonna wake, it's gonna wake up, yeah. You know, and, and and you know, only through surgery has it somewhat had a wake up. Other than that, it would not have had because they had to reroute his nerves someplace oh, yeah. else, which what was which was a lot. Yeah. <sighs> All right. So I know that this that experience has. Um, basically, you know, put you on a path of helping moms and helping with mental health and self-care and helping with advocacy. Um, so how, how, has that, how has that experience that you went through in the hospital and um, as a mom of a child with special needs now um, influenced the work that you're doing now? It's, it's been a, a, a big influence because I feel, you know, since I was so green about it and had never heard of it, have never heard of any of that, hadn't even heard of gestational diabetes at the time, I, it's it springboarded me to want to help other families um, because to, you know, to bring awareness to the situation. Um, it may not be brachial plexus, uh, but any, anything, anything can happen. And so it's, it's helped me to develop, you know, I have, a I have, a, a, I guess a natural uh, care and concern for women that are, you know, carrying children. You go in the hospital, it, it doesn't mean it's going to be like you think. It, it didn't happen for me. And it's it's angered me to the point to where I want to help others. I want to tell others. I want to say, hey, you know, think about this. Here are a list of things that can happen. Here are a list of things that if it happens, this is what you should do. Here's who you need to seek out. It, it's it's. I've been fueled for a long time, even before I start advocating and start wanting to speak to families um, of disabled children. But I had to kind of take a step back at first because I was so angry. I had to kind of check myself, if you will, because it was it was a lot, and it was you know it was all it was to me. It was like, why me? What is what did I do to deserve this? Why did they do this to me? You know, there were several different things. That, that is part. Like, in your man, that's in your part mind. of the morning. That's part of the morning process, like yes, or well, not necessarily mourning, but like um, grieving, 
the yeah the breathing or process and like the that, acceptance yeah. like learning to accept like you go through that you go through the anger stage you go through mm-hmm. the the why me the blaming yourself the blaming other people just being angry for a very long time mm-hmm. and 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 i'm glad that you were able to recognize that and kind of work on that before you started working with other families because a lot of the time when we don't have, when we have those unresolved issues the fu- the fire is there which is great right but then it's misdirected a lot of the time you know and that's what mm-hmm. took me so long you know he's an adult now and you know he aged out of the local children's hospital here at 21 and um it took me a minute to get you know to to want I, you know the desire was there but to follow through with it it took me a minute because i had to make sure i was you know my attitude was right and i wasn't projecting that anger and if I were, I needed to make sure that I worked on projecting it in a positive way because you are angry because you don't have answers. You don't know why you didn't expect this. They blow you off. There's a lot of factors that play into that. And you're not you just have so many questions and so many circumstances that you need answers to that it, you're just angry and you're not even really thinking about delivery and how you say things. So I had to take a step back for a minute to get myself <laughs> together before I spoke to anyone else. Um, because I, I know that when you get passionate about something, I know, especially with me, it may come off mean or abrupt or, and I don't want to do that. I want to make sure I'm clear, but not, um, uh, shouting or angry, even though I was angry, of course I'm better now, but it's, it's still, it, it lurks in the back of your mind. You still look back and think, why you know what for and then, Why and this happen? yeah and then the thing with um us women of color right we already are at a disadvantage when we're speaking mm-hmm. right but then if we're getting angry then we start getting um cataloged as the angry black woman or mm-hmm. the angry brown woman right so a lot of the time we have to tailor our message to make it more palatable for other people mm-hmm. so that they can you know um absorb what we're saying and not say like oh she's just she's just mad that's just her disposition she's always right. mad all the time she's always mad about all these things mm-hmm. whatever very true that's exactly that's exactly right that's exactly right unfortunately so what did uh, i know we've spoken about this before but um i want you to tell the comadres what you did to help yourself um through your mental health journey to like deal with the anger I know you have um, um, a lot of spiritual support mm-hmm. and um, you you talk to your spiritual mentor about that. But like, I want you to kind of go into a little more detail on, on how you arrived at that, that, that solution for yourself. Well, the, the, the way I arrived at that solution, um, my spiritual person that, that that's like my advisor, uh, she knew the situation and it's kind of how I arrived at that was because it was someone that was close enough to me to see what was going on and was able to direct me and, you know, pray with me and, and, and really, because I am so passionate and I can be so direct and not to be angry all the time. You know, there, there, I arrived at that because she knew, she knew me and she knew how I operate. So with that, talking to someone that you know helped me. Um, also, what helped me was to write down. You know, you can journal. Um, that that could be a form of self care. You can journal. Um, you can. You know, a lot of times people they journal, they exercise, they do yoga, they do stretching exercises and breathing. That's it. Depends. All that's fine. There's no wrong way to do it. But for me, having a person that I can talk to, and they say as women. Women talk way more than men for, for every, I can't remember the numbers, but for every, so for every word they have, we have 20. And I don't know if that's the correct number. And so I think for women, we have to talk about it. And by talking about it, it, it gets, it, it comes up out of there and it, it, it gets in, it, you know, you're talking and that means, you know, each time you talk, you're freeing yourself. You're letting this, you know, the steam valve off the top and you're getting it out. And that's what worked for me. That's how I arrived at that because I know that I have to talk it out. I can't just be quiet about it. I can't just, 
I had to talk to someone. Um, and I had to get it out that way. Um, and, and that's how I arrived at that, at that, at that juncture because talking for me works. Uh, and I, as I said, I think, you know, a lot of women are the same way. They need somebody they could talk to. Uh, I could have went a different direction and, and maybe have gone to see someone professional. I, I never did, but for me, the, the talking it out with someone that knew, that knew the situation and that, had a spiritual background could, could lead me into where that all that anger was, you know, I didn't just hold it in. It was let out. It was like steam. It was gone. You know, I still am passionate about, about it these many years later because it happened. And I hate to hear that it's still happening and any disability, uh, any disparity against children or, you know, during birth and, you know, women during birth, their most vulnerable, our most vulnerable time of our lives. And then it's like you get slapped in the face because you have all that, 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 that plays in your mind. So having someone to talk to journaling, exercising, breathing, whatever it is, there's, there's no wrong way to do it. It's just, you have to get it out. And I had to do that. That's what worked best for me. Amazing. So besides um, talking to your spiritual um, mentor or teacher, um, what else do you do to pour into yourself? I would say I, I read. Um, I'm always doing some research about um, I pour into myself by educating myself about other other injuries, other different abilities, other parents that have other issues uh, in, in this arena. Um, and to learn, I don't, I think in order to be in this arena, you can't be ignorant about any of this. You have to be well-rounded. You have to know that, okay, this is what we have, but what about those other people that don't have this? They have, you know, children with autism. I see a lot of that. I research, I read a lot. So pouring into myself is educating myself on other injuries and other disabilities or different abilities. Um, and just, you know, Log, you know, I log on now and I, you know, hop on Instagram and I read other, you know, moms that are going through similar situations and I chat with them and I talk to them. And that, that pours into me to pour into someone else because I, you know, I didn't have that. So that helps me to help someone else because I want to help someone else. Um, as I said before, I, I, I coined myself the term veteran mom because what I've done 26 years ago you ladies are going through now and you're doing a great job. I didn't have what you have now. So that helps me to pour into myself because there's a, there was a gap between what's new now and what was going on when my son was born. So that helps me understand, you know, what you ladies were going through and, and the things that you have to do that I didn't or the things that I did have to do that you don't have to. And so that comes with educating myself and reading and, and that's, kind of where I'm at. I research a lot. I write a lot. I journal a lot just to, to pour into myself to make me aware of what I'm, what I'm speaking about, what's new, what's trending, you know, what, what's going on, you know, in the medical community that helps me to be able to help someone else. That's awesome. Um, so I know, I know you still have a lot on your plate cause you know, you're still supporting your son and, and you're doing so much, you're working full time and then you're helping other mothers, so what do you do to take care of yourself? Like, what do you do for self-care? Usually for self-care, um, a lot of times I just, I get in the quiet space. Um, I'm, I've always been a TV watcher. I kind of, I kind of don't do that as much as I used to. I used to have to watch that rerun or, or watch that, you know, or watch the, I, you know, I kind of unplugged from that. And I just get some alone time. And sometimes that's meditation, praying, journaling, all of that. You know, I, that's, that works for me because I go so much and I do so much, even though my son's an adult now, but there's still other things that you have to do. So I, you know, being quiet means a lot to me. You know, I've always, there's always some noise and always something going on, you know, just getting in a quiet space, having a warm cup of something, you know, your coffee, your tea, your latte, whatever. And just actually spending time with yourself, I'm there. You know, I used to hear people that say they did that, and I'd be like, "Huh? You, you're, what? You do that? It works. It, it works for me, and that's a form of my self care. Um, and so, you know, some there's other things I do. I'll go, you know, 
wine tasting or something just to, you know, to get out um, of my norm, just to kind of break the mold a little bit. But there's a there's a, just a lot of different things that you can do. But to me, when you get quiet time with yourself, you can hear yourself think. You can answer yourself if you have questions. You, you know, oh, today was like this. Or, what did I do? Or, what did I accomplish? Things like that. That's for me a form of self. That's my form of self care, preferred self care. That's amazing. So yeah, like I, I I really support the work that you're doing um in creating community. I mean, the goal of this podcast, you know, is to create community and, and support other mothers mm-hmm. and provide that 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 village, right? That I didn't right. have. Right. When my first son first got diagnosed, you know, um, it was a very isolating event for me, and um, I don't want I don't want any other mothers to go through it alone right. anymore. Right. Like we're here for each other, and um, I feel like now after the pandemic, we're recognizing the value of community and um, standing together as brothers and sisters to support each other and give each other, you know, and pour into each other and, and um, uplift each other and be right. there for each other. Cause like this whole, like this capitalistic um, ideology of like, oh, self-made and pull yourself up by the bootstraps. No, that's not how our ancestors were. We supported each other. It took a village. It needs to take a village now. We were not put on this earth to be alone and just, be lone wolves out here in the wilderness nah like we have each other and if i can help another mom in whatever capacity i can that's what we're here for and i know that that's what you're doing as well and and you know i really support the work that you're doing um comadres if you if you need any kind of support melanie is here for you um, she's going to be, I'm going to be putting her um, links in the show notes, um, but let's continue with the conversation. So um, I know part of part of the work that you did um, after you had your son diagnosed, like, you know, enforcing boundaries with people, you know, how, like to, to be able to keep yourself centered and not overextend yourself. So how, how is it that you enforce boundaries necessarily? I think the way that this best way to to enforce boundaries is to be real with yourself. We as women and, and, and we as mothers, we want to be super women and do it all and, and be all and all of that. And that's fine. But enforcing boundaries, you and, and sometimes enforcing boundaries comes with enforcing boundaries on yourself, not just other people. I think that we're too hard on ourselves. Uh, I know I was when it came to Am I doing the right thing? Am I caring for him correctly? Um, how, you know, all of those things play big questions in your mind. Enforcing boundaries for yourself first, because if you do it for yourself first, you will definitely be on the path to enforce them with other people. Um, you have to be an advocate for yourself first. That that That's just number one. You have to do it for yourself first. And enforcing boundaries, then that teaches people how to treat you. That teaches people how to accept what you're doing, whether they want to or not. Here's what we're doing over here. And here's the line. If you cross it, you know, then you're going to, there's going to be, a, a, you know, there's some circumstances and consequences to that. Um, and I think we as women sometimes trying to do everything because usually we have to, because we want things done a certain way. We can kind of, we can kind of enforce that boundary on ourselves because it doesn't have to be a certain way. We, we're way up here with that. Sometimes we can kind of lower that standard a little. I'm not saying just abandon it all, but just lower the standard a little to, and give yourself some grace. I don't think we give ourselves enough grace. You took the words out of my mouth. I was going to say that. Mm-hmm. We, <laughs> we have to treat each other. Like we give people so much grace, right? But on ourselves, we are so hard on ourselves. Yeah. A lot of the time, Sometimes, like I've worked on this a lot because I used to be super mean to myself. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And, and and it all comes like, it's that inner dialogue, you know, switching that inner dialogue and giving your, sorry, you know, I'm in the heights. So, you know, there's going to be music <laughs> popping up on the interview. But 
um, you know, giving ourselves grace and, 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 and forgiving ourselves and letting ourselves be human and being okay with that. Because the thing is, like, a lot of the time we're like, yeah, I'm not going to do that. But then you're, like, still dealing with the guilt, right? right. Dealing with right. the guilt and, like, giving yourself crap about not doing the thing that you said that you were going to do. Or right. not doing it to the capacity that you thought you were going to be able to do it. Right. You know? We need to learn. We need to learn that. I think because the women that raised us, um, our grandmothers, our mothers, our aunts that are in our in our families, we've seen them be this. You know, and then we have to, we figure we have to be that. And that's fine to be strong, but you know what? You have to give yourself grace because there are gonna be those days, especially when you have a special needs child. You there are gonna be days where you don't have the strength to do anything but care for them. You can't do dishes. You can't do dinner. You can't do, you can't do whatever that task is. You just can't. And I think women get, uh, get bent out of shape because of that. It, it, you know what? No, it's not going away until you do it anyway. So, so it can stay there two or three days. That maybe not be your ideal time frame, but give yourself some grace, give yourself some time give yourself because we do so much you know we, we 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 have our hands are full all day every day i i follow a couple of mommies online on instagram and when i start you know when i scroll sometimes i feel like i'm late because i get up really early and they usually post things in the evening and i see you know today they had a meltdown and it makes me mad because i'm like girl don't I mean there's there's nothing wrong with having your meltdown if that's what you need to do. I'm not saying that, but I just want to reach out and say, hey, it's okay. You can cry, you can be angry, you can be mad. Those are very valid feelings. And you have people that don't understand your child's different ability and they, they want to make comments. I've been seeing this a lot. This has been coming up a lot, which angers me because it's ignorance. Period. If you don't know about something, research it. But don't ridicule the mom or the family because their child is doing something that you don't approve of. You have no, you, you don't have control over that. And I we see that. Follow, a lot. Um, we both follow um, Moments of Joy podcast. What's her name? Oh, I, um, I can't think of her name. Um, Camille. Camille. We both Camille. follow Camille, right? Right. And she was saying that, like, she was at, I don't know, I think she was at a doctor's office up appointment yeah. with her son. And somebody, mm -hmm. like, he was doing something and somebody was literally looking at him, like, giving him a side eye. And it's, like, it's so mean. Like, if you don't know what is going on with that child, you have no business as, as an adult having any kind of opinion. How about keep it to yourself? And if you can't look away, step out of the freaking room. Because, right. like... Right. The, the, that mom, that family is going through enough already as it is, and your That's, judgment is not helping them in the slightest at all. And she, I, I think you may have saw that too, where she, she had that. You may have saw that story I, I, that she had, and I'm thinking, this, you know, then my mind starts to go a different direction. I'm like, how dare you? You don't know what people are going through, and to make comments, I know I read somewhere somebody else said that they had their child was acting out, uh, was having some behavior meltdown in a public place. And someone made a comment, oh, she just needs to spank him. It, 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 no, I need to spank you. Maybe do I need to spank you? Because you can't, you don't know what's going on. And people are so, people are so ignorant because if it hasn't happened to them, they don't think that it happens to anyone. They think that, oh, something's wrong with you. But I've never had that happen, and you can't be that. Yeah, like you're a bad, you're a bad, you're bad or you're cursed, or you're down. whatever. And and it's not that you have to take into consideration. My the, here's the way I really feel about that. If all of us were the same, none of us would be necessary. And I mean that we're all different, and that's what makes the world go round. Is that we're all different? We all have something different to contribute to this society. All of us. If we were all the same, none of us would be necessary. Where would the world be if we were all, you know, molds of the same thing? If we were all the same, 
it would be a pretty boring place. And I think God has a better use of his time than to make us all the same. So to talk about people and to make assumptions about other people's children, number one, that's just not an area that you need to tread in. You don't know what's going on in their family. You don't know what's going on. You don't know why that child is the way it is. You don't know. Um, and people are, shouldn't have to feel like, oh, I need to wear a label saying I'm this kind of mom or my child. I mean, you know, you wear t-shirts to say autism mom or, or cerebral palsy. That's fine. But you should, you know, people should be, even though we have no control over that, but people need to be more aware. Keep your comments to yourself because you show your ignorance when you don't. And that, that hurts other people. Um, their child has an issue that you know nothing about that you need not comment about. And so, like you said, either, you know, look away or step out of the room because they have enough going on. We all have enough going on as parents with special, of special needs children that we don't need all that. Um, and you can't expect people in the public to give you grace because they don't, because they don't care. I, I just, it's just boils down to, they don't care. It's not me. So I don't care. And that's why this community, I admire all of you ladies um, in the, in, in this, you know, in the 2000 era, because you have things in place that I didn't have. Facebook was very, just, just barely getting started. There was no Instagram. There was none of that. And so we weren't able to connect in this big world we live in, it was very big then. It's it's not as small. It was not as small as it is now because we're able to get on IG and get on podcasts, get on YouTube and make videos to talk about it. And I commend all of you ladies for that because you have so many more resources than I had. And, but still you have a lot more, I don't want to, I don't mean it this way, issues, but you have a lot of, uh, of extra going on than I did. And you have to manage all that. And there are days you're going to want to break down and melt down and that's okay. But give yourself some grace. I can't say that enough because you are doing a phenomenal job. Nobody can walk in your shoes. Nobody has walked in your shoes. So they don't understand. You're doing a great job. All of you ladies, I commend you because it, I'm sitting there going, I'm scrolling going, wow, Ooh, they can connect with each other and they can talk to each other and they can see, you know, in this, this, you know, technology age, you guys like we are now, we can see each other. And some people may need to see, they don't, may not just want to talk on the phone. They may need to see you. And I think that, that, that is phenomenal that you ladies do that and you reach out and you share, because when I was going through this, that was unheard of, very unheard of. Yeah. So yeah. through the podcast, I want to continue to create inclusive spaces, right? Yes. Places where, the moms, the kids, the dads, like everybody feels safe bringing their kids around and like feeling like that, that people won't be so judgmental and that they're going to be more aware. Um, you know, I don't, I don't care for autism awareness because we know what autism, everybody knows what autism is. I want acceptance. I want acceptance for our children. I want to break down barriers, to break down stigmas. Right. to um you know educate our communities of color um and uh, about the socialization of our children you mm -hmm. know acceptance of other children with special needs as a matter of fact before we hopped on here i saw somebody say um when you have a neurotypical child and they're staring at a child with special needs you shouldn't say don't stare what you should say is do you want to go say hi? Do you want to ask them a question? Absolutely. Teaching them to socialize with them. Because when you say don't stare, that means like you're telling them like ignore them, mm -hmm. you know, which is which is also wrong. Like you shouldn't be ignoring anybody. But, you know, right. there's convert there's hard conversations that we can have and there's things that make us uncomfortable. And that's OK. We have to work through that discomfort to be yes. able to create more inclusive environments for everyone. And that's a great point. That's a that's an excellent point, Marcy. Because the, don't stare, don't look, don't say the don'ts is all they hear. So then they're gonna draw away from that and not explore and not even maybe be a friend of you know another child is because oh don't 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 all you hear is don't uh, and don'ts like a, a red flag or a red stop sign or a red light. Oh no 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 I can't talk to them and and as you said you know go and say hi go and say hello or go you know. 
go and walk up to them and, you know, oh, their shirt is anything other than just, you know, don't and don't do this. And and I think that's important because that sends a bigger message. That sends an inclusive message. That, that's why I am, I'm really not keen on the word disability. I like the word different ability because the first three were the first three letters are DIS. And, you know, we know what dis means. You dis something that means it's not good. Or you don't have, or you're not, and that puts people in a box that they should not be in. So different ability, we're all different. You have a different ability than I have. I have a different ability than you have. Like my son, he's only able to use one hand, fully functioning. His left hand, not so much. But has anyone ever taken the time to think that children that have different abilities may think something is different about us because? What my son, mm-hmm. namely, can do with one hand, it takes us two hands to do. So let's turn that around. What does he think? He might think, oh, you guys are wimps. I can do that with one hand, but it takes you two. <laughs> you know, because he rides a motorcycle. He plays the guitar. He's a musician. He rides a motorcycle. He has a motorcycle. And, of course, it drives me crazy to a point, but he can ride it with one hand. But it takes everybody else too. So that was my next question. I was going to ask you what makes him sparkle, and, and it seems like he was very outgoing. Wow. Oh, he's, he's he when when he was born, and I was going through all this. My grandmother, who's now ninety eight, she told me, and you know, it takes your grandmother to tell you about yourself and your mom. And my grandma, she's very she's very soft spoken, and she's she's just very cool and laid back. And she told me, and it made me cry. She said, Melanie. There's nothing wrong with him. Something's wrong with you. And I was like, wow. <laughs> okay, Granny, you told me. I'm, I'm going to take that and go with it. And again, it shut me up because I'm like, yeah, something was wrong with me because I I had the the forethought that all these things were going to be wrong with him. But he was he was showing showing up every day and it was not none of that. So he rides a motorcycle with one hand. He plays the guitar with one. He's a musician, self-taught musician. He plays the guitar. He bowls. He roller skates. He plays football. He played football in, in middle school and high school. He does everything. And because he has the determination to do it, it's done. I, you know, I used to cringe when he played football, but he was a he was a kicker because the doctors won't only let allow him to, you know, do that because he couldn't have upper body contact because of his arm. And that drove me crazy that he once they finally cleared him to play football, it was on from there. But he 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 does whatever he wants. He in his eyes, I can do whatever I want. And when you tell him that he can't, he's going to, he's going to prove you wrong every time. And he's done that every time. You can't do that. How are you going to ride? People have said, how does he ride a motorcycle with one hand? I don't know because I don't ride a motorcycle. I have no idea. But he gets it done. He has a motorcycle down in the garage now. He has a motorcycle, and I'm like. So I I, I read something somewhere one time that said that um, the biggest imitation for children with special needs are the parents. It's not them. It's not them. And, you know, I was we were able his dad and I were able to. We didn't we let him do whatever, even, you know, as a mom, you cringe and like, oh, I don't want you to play football. Oh, they're going to knock you down. Oh, my God. You know, you think all those things. Um, And that was a limitation. And. I learned early on how to keep my mouth shut, even though it probably doesn't seem like it. But I learned early on how to keep my mouth closed and just say, okay, he can do whatever. But here are the here here are what the doctor says are are, are good, and here's what we can do. So if you follow these lists, we're good. And that's, you know, when it came to football, you know, the coach in his high school said, if all of these young men would show up on time and early and stay late and help and do the things that he does, I wouldn't have a complaint because he would, he, he had that much drive to do it. He had that much drive to make it work. And parents can be, a, a, you know, limiting because we know, and I think, I don't think it's such a bad thing to this degree. I think we have it because we know what's out there in the world. They don't. We've seen it and we don't want them to experience those things. And we don't want them to experience discouragement and disparity. And so we tend to want to hold them a little closer or a little longer or to keep them from experiencing heartbreak uh, growing up. 
And so I think that's why we do it. I, I can really say for myself, that's why I've done it because, you know, I just, I had learned early to just be quiet and okay, here's our, if you, as long as you follow these parameters, we're good. And I had to learn how to release that early and, and early on and just let it go. And, you know, they don't resent anything. They're not resentful. Oh, mom, you didn't let me play football or mom, you didn't let me play basketball. You, you just have to show people, as you said, you have to enforce those boundaries. Once you do that, and people understand who you are and what you stand for with your child, they get it. They'll get it. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Yeah. So I wanted to share, I wanted to kind of end the show on this um, note. My aunt, one time from my dad's side of the family, um, she came to visit um, from Dominican Republic and um, she, had, she hadn't spent any time with me and, and my son. And um, one day, I'm dealing with him and um, she, he was having a hard time with something and I was able to like get him back to um, his, uh, his, his, his um, regular, you know, norm, normal. Um, and she pulls me to the side and I'm like on the verge of tears. And she was like, you know, God picks special people to be the parents of children with special needs and girl, let me tell you, I was on the verge of tears when she said that. I was bawling hysterical. I was hysterical because it was like, you know, I'm thinking I'm a crappy mom because, like, you know, all the stuff that's going on. But, like, she was able to see the work that I was doing with my child. And, like, that, like, it was, like, it, like, illuminated something inside of me. And it was just, it was, it was, it was a lot. But, um. With that, I'm going to end the episode there, comadres. Follow me on, on Instagram, my comadre on the pod. And follow Melody on IG at I Know That Voice 85. And if you have any questions at all, please feel free to send me a comadre gram at my email at marciacomadreandopod.com or slide up into my DMs. Comadres, don't forget to go on my website www.comadreandopod.com to get yourself some official comadre merch. Um, and thank you for spending time with your comadres. Have a good evening. Bye. Have a good evening. Bye. Entre comadres.